What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> I've been enjoying myself. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> what have you got going here? Oh, we have a, an energy device that uh, takes uh, electrons that are available just about everywhere and uh, converts them into useful energy. Okay. Now, how do you do that? Well, uh, uh, once you move them, ambient uh, would uh, would be the background, and uh, once you move uh, energy away from uh, our energy source away from the background, like moving water up a hill it will always come down. Mm -hmm. In the case of electrons, if you excite them or the level of excitement is uh, above the ambient or background, you have useful energy. Well, how did you come up with this conclusion? Well, uh, uh, it, when I realized that uh, it was the movement of the electrons or the acceleration that was the uh, principal source of the energy, uh, then I had to f develop a way to uh, capture it or transfer it into uh, a more useful uh, source. Okay. Well, what was your intention by doing this? What were you trying by to do? By doing it? Uh, what was my intention? Uh, uh, basically, uh, I had heard that uh, it couldn't be done, and uh, <laughs> all the experts told me that, and uh, 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 that didn't ring very true to me, so uh, uh, I decided I would see if uh, what they were saying was actually true. When I realized that the components in an electrical field has an alternate component of magnetic mm -hmm. field, and that they're equal and opposite, and that's your Lorentz uh, or your equal and opposite uh, EMF uh, posed uh, sort of thing, uh -huh. and they do not uh, appear separate and uh, being in the field of geology there were electromagnetic maps which were available uh, which told me that the earth's surface had a tremendous amount of electricity in it uh, that was useful hmm. and uh, in trying to resolve that in regards to the activity of electrons I realized that uh, Energy is everywhere at all times in great amounts, and that uh, it's dormant until you disturb it or cycle it. And uh, the cycling would be the resonant uh, activity seen in radio devices. Hmm. So you're moving electrons and you're creating uh, electro and magnetic fields. And uh, by being able to capture these fields uh, at their higher levels of excitement, uh, you get greater, uh, you have a, a gradient that's greater getting back to ambient, so therefore you have a greater amount of energy. Um, now, what's your background? How did you come up with all that? My background, I'm a professional in uh, science. Uh, my uh, work history was primarily connected with the petroleum industry. I mm -hmm. uh, have an engineering uh, background. I'm fully familiar with all of the establishment's ideas uh, in regards to electricity and electromechanics yeah. and physics and all the other things that relate to it. And uh, uh, have always had a very uh, doubtful eye towards uh, anything that the establishment might uh, consider appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, uh, when people told me that this thing would not happen, to forget about it, uh, uh, that was the uh, match that lit the haystack. Uh, I think it's the end of the road as far as energy goes. Uh, I think that if uh, there are any other developments, uh, this one is benign as far as environment is concerned. It's uh, uh, cost, uh, very cost effective. Uh, it's something which can be all over the world. It's not something which belongs to any one individual, any one country. And that uh, basically uh, the effect will be... Uh, uh, the one side effect of this is it generates ozone, mm. uh, which it actually puts oxygen back into the atmosphere, and none of the uh, energy methods available today do that. There's almost nothing, uh, there's really nothing out there that you can think of that does not use this system. 
Is this similar to what Nikola Tesla was trying to achieve with free? Uh, it is a spin-off. Uh, basically, what I have done is pick up where Nikola Tesla uh, had reached, and I've ex put myself inside his mind, uh -huh. and I've expanded and extended uh, what Nikola Tesla was doing. Now, do you think you've actually figured out what he was doing? Were you yeah, I can, I can read his mind uh, almost perfect. Uh, uh, actually... Uh, uh, I did not know about Tesla until I was into this thing uh, uh, more than five years, I guess. Really? Yes, and uh, I knew the name, but I had no idea as to exactly the significance of it. And people started saying, well, uh, you're doing what Tesla did, uh, building the same kinds of coils and doing all the same types of things. And at that point, well, it really got interesting because I realized that uh, there were other people out there that were thinking along the same line. Now, you had mentioned something about James Clerk Maxwell. Yes. Some of the paperwork. What, what do you know about that? Okay, in the case of uh, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, uh, he was professor at Cambridge University, and uh, uh, he picked up... Uh, uh, all of the things which Maxwell did had been done previously, and he put them in a mathematical uh, shape uh, so that they could be described and repeated. And he's one of the fellows that uh, I mentioned that uh, have to have all the pieces of the puzzle except one. So anyhow, uh, his thinking and mine are amazingly close together because I have uh, researched and gone back to his his personal thinking. The books that are out, which I have uh, some of the original ones, uh, original set, uh, were put together after he died by the faculty at Cambridge University. And they reflect what was politically correct to the faculty at Cambridge University. They do not reflect what Maxwell actually said and thought. So you're saying if he didn't have to go through the whole peer acceptance process, we would have had a different book? Yes. Really? Yeah, well, the, what actually came out of it was not Maxwell at all anyhow. It was the faculty in the physics department at Cambridge University with what they considered politically correct. Oliver Heavisides was your EMC squared uh, uh, source, and uh, it was lifted by uh, Einstein, uh, and I can show you uh, exactly where Einstein got it from. Really? Now, how much earlier are we talking here? Uh, about a, almost 100, well, between 50 and 100 years earlier. Yes, uh, most people think that I've kind of fell out of a tree, but yeah. uh, when they realize that I've had total access to the Library of Congress, uh, to dozens of university libraries, uh, including here in the United States, overseas, including uh, Italy and Germany and France and England, and uh, I've gone through these libraries uh, uh, like you wouldn't believe. I knew uh, from the first moment that, I, that it was going to work and how it was going to work. Really? Were you trying to build something specific at the time? No, uh, all I was trying to do was disturb ambient. Really? Now, tell me something about these radio frequencies. I understand you're using radio frequencies to achieve this. Well, uh, the electron, uh, when you cycle it or move it, you get a, a magnetic uh, field and you get an electrical field. Mm -hmm. And the faster you move the electron, the cumulative effect of that magnetic and electrical field uh, becomes greater. Okay. So if you're cycling at, say, 60 or 120 cycles per second, you get the uh, same amount of electrons. And then you cycle, say, at a million cycles per second, the curve on the increase in the amount of uh, magnetic and electrical field there is doing this. Mm. And uh, when it does this, and you capture it at one of the higher points, uh, you capture it at a higher point, you get a lot more energy from the same amount of electrons than you had at the lower point. Okay. So uh, this, uh, to some people, would be uh, would, would say that you're getting free energy. What would you call it? Uh, I would say you're getting what's there. <laughs> Just finding a new way. To uh, uh, you're getting what's there. Uh, the term free energy is a bastardized uh, uh, terminology that's used by Sour Grapes uh, uh, establishment. 
use terms of the alternative? Okay, uh, they're all basically uh, the same same thing. They're talk uh, ether, ether, uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, uh, air, or whatever. They're all describing the same thing, and it's a hula hoop uh, mentality. Uh, it's whoever happens to be writing the book or talking at the time, and uh, they're grasping at something at which they don't really understand. Genetically. Okay, uh, in the 19 and 20s, uh, people discovered that the, uh, in studying the Earth's crust that uh, it had electrical characteristics. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people consider that the Earth's uh, electrical field is uh, useless or near zero. But uh, when you actually uh, look into it, you find that the Earth has an enormous electrical charge on it. Uh, it's just that it's everywhere about you. It, it doesn't vary uh, in a short distance. So all of the instruments that are made to measure electricity are made to measure a reference point and another point. So uh, the electrical flux, when you start measuring electrical flux, are magnetic flux. Uh, which is the other side of the coin, you find that the Earth has an enormous uh, uh, electrical field. Uh, no, I had the uh, conclusion before I ever started. Uh, it was what got me into it to begin with. Really? So this is, this is sort of what keyed you into what was going on? Yeah, I knew that uh, uh, there was an electrical, electromagnetic. Uh -huh. it, uh, you can't have one without the other, and it flips. And uh, when it flips, uh, at that flipping point is where you have your useful energy. And the more you flip it, the more you have useful energy. Does this have anything to do with the planet running at 8 hertz or anything like that? Well, uh, the death frequency is 7 cycles per second. Mm -hmm. So the Earth is, uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, has a frequency of around 7 or 8 cycles per second. Yeah. And that's consistent. Now, if you built a device that would capture that, you would have an energy level, but it would be very low because you're not flipping the electrons uh, uh, that much. Now, uh, in the other Earth's electrical systems, uh, there are a number of them running all at one time. You have the uh, uh, ionized layers that are up above. They're one side of a capacitor. The Earth's crust is, or the surface is one side of a capacitor. So you have an enormous electrical potential between the ionized layers and the Earth's surface, and you have an exact duplicate of it in the Earth's surface because in a capacitor, one plate has to equal the other one, mm -hmm. or else you've got discharges between them. And it's the turbulence in the atmosphere that uh, disturbs this uh, uh, balance that uh, where you get your lightning and other electrical disturbances. So uh, the lightning is over unity in itself. Uh, ambient or gr earth ground is uh, unity. And uh, anything that you see other than that is over unity. So that means that lightning is over unity. <laughs> Okay, uh, everything in nature, uh, and everything in nature is, of course, simple. So uh, all the other things, including uh, molecules and everything else, they all uh, attach themselves to each other. Uh -huh. So in the case of electrons, it's unreal to believe that a single electron will be floating out here uh, without uh, being interacting with something else. Mm -hmm. So as it turns out... Uh, uh, there's uh, good evidence that uh, some electrons have more negative charge than others and that uh, by being more negative or less negative that that's the same as being plus or minus. So therefore, uh, the uh, electron with a weaker charge will attract one with a stronger charge and they will be uh, orbiting in each other and they're relatively easy to pull apart. So uh, uh, the electrical and magnetic charge of the electron, of course, when you spin them, uh, spin them right, you get a magnetic field. When you spin them left, you get an electrical field. Okay. So when they spin apart, 
uh, you're getting a benefit of both of those. And then whenever they come spinning back together, uh, you're getting the volts and the magnetic field uh, coupling again, which means your amps, amps times volts equal watts, or you've got useful energy. Well, uh, actually, uh, this thing remakes the entire world of energy. It's a very simple uh, uh, supposition, and uh, when put in force, uh, uh, it creates a world in which there's no pollution. It creates a world in which uh, there are no uh, uh, not-haves. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the political systems are on equal standing, so you don't have a reason for war. So uh, that saves a lot of lives, and it also puts uh, ozone back or oxygen back into a useful form, uh, which uh, also will save a lot of lives. Okay, this is the state of uh, Colorado. Okay, and uh, the colors on the map uh, represent uh, levels of uh, electromagnetic uh, energy. Okay, and uh, you can see there's quite a diversity. Okay, now what are all these colors here? Okay, the dark uh, dark blues are extremely negative. Uh, the reds are the lower ranges of negativity. The contour lines on there, each contour represents about 5,000 volts difference in the electrical field. So what would this be used for normally? Why would somebody take a uh, These were originally used uh, by the United States government in looking for radioactive materials during the Cold War. Hmm. Now, how did you come up with the idea of looking for these? Well, uh, they have been used for locating uh, oil and gas deposits uh, since 1920. Okay. <laughs> Uh, they've been used since 1920 for locating uh, oil and gas deposits. Okay. Now, why do you use them? What are you looking for with these maps? Uh, why would I normally use them? Yeah. I mean, what would you be looking for? Uh, you basically, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I had reached a level in the petroleum industry where my salary was uh, uh, too much, and I uh, had too much experience, and the people that were in the company all had less, and they felt uncomfortable around me. So uh, suddenly one day I found myself without a job. Uh, this has to do with the uh, frequencies which uh, things move at whenever you get into uh, resonant energy. Uh, resonant just simply means that you're flipping the electrons. And uh, this uh, is the electromagnetic chart uh, that was worked up by Westinghouse and uh, can be purchased through the uh, Edmund Scientific uh, for $11 okay. in case you want to buy one. So this is, this or the is Exploratorium here. out in uh, San Francisco, uh, which is the, they're the people that had it put together by Westinghouse. Now what does this have to do with your technology? Uh, it uh, shows the cycling or the frequency, uh, radio frequency. Uh, it starts at, at uh, say, zero cycles per second and moves up through the various frequencies into the gigahertz and then it goes on even beyond that. So uh, uh, Farnsworth, for example, was the person who actually invented the television tube uh, that we uh, have today and uh, he did that in the process of working with the exact same type of thing which I'm working with. Uh, he had to build the television tube itself is an over unity device. Is it? Yeah, it's an offshoot of a dynode and a number of other things. And a, a dynode basically is where you have a, in a radio tube a cathode, which is the input side, and you have a, an anode, which uh, the electrons move from the cathode to the anode. Okay, in the case of the uh, dynode, you have alternate. Uh, 
anodes in here which this thing is bouncing off of and if you have a certain type of material on these anodes one electron leaving here and bouncing to this one knocks say 50,000 electrons loose which bounce to the next stage which knocks uh, uh, 5 million electrons loose which goes to the next stage which knocks 50 million electrons loose and then the anode here collects them and you have uh, 50 million times the amount of electrons active here that you had here so you have uh, gained 50 million times what you started out with. So it's some kind of multiplier. It's a multiplier and uh, uh, it was renamed by Farnsworth and called a multipactor and uh, uh, basically he was using a uh, like a radio emitting uh, substance here, mm -hmm. you have this same thing in a uh, light detector in uh, cameras and uh, other things which open and close the uh, shutter based on the ambient light. Mm -hmm. uh, a small amount of light hits the, a cathode which uh, uh, knock some electrons loose mm -hmm. and they start bouncing through the dynode system and they end up being enough electricity to operate the shutter in your camera. So you have an enormous amount of uh, output compared to the input. Interesting. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say about this? Chart? Well, uh, the same thing applies in changing frequencies here. The same amount of electricity inserted at a lower level raised to a higher frequency will disturb uh, more of the uh, electro and the magnetic field which at that point you capture and you have a huge gain over what you put in. Fantastic. Okay, well, so that does fall right into what you're talking so about. So you have not violated any laws of physics but you have an enormous amount of energy that you did not have to begin with. What do you call it when you capture this wavelength? Do you have a name for it? When you capture it? Yeah, like obviously... Well, you can temporarily store it in capacitors, uh, batteries, or coils, or various other systems temporarily, and then you can convert it to some other uh, system that is uh, useful to the device which you need to power. So the energy just doesn't tear around wildly. No, it's not just running all over the place. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes it gets loose in the form of sparks or uh, uh, spacks or whatever. Is this what over here? Uh, the devices which I have invented, which there are a number of them, they all uh, uh, actually accelerate electrons. Okay. They're electron accelerators and... Uh, uh, one of the outcomes I might mention of the multipactor thing which Farnsworth had, which is a over-unity device without question, is the magnetron in your microwave oven. Mm, okay. So all patents are related to magnetrons, uh, multipactors, uh, dynodes, uh, uh, and all related patents are over-unity patents. Fantastic. And there's no way to deny it. If the person has any, uh, even slight in a degree of intellect, uh, they will know immediately that that's the case. So this has been sitting in front of us the whole time? Yeah, it's been here since 1920s and 30s uh, uh, in grand form. Before we go to the other devices, uh, this is a component uh, which shows up on some of the devices. Okay. And uh, can you sit, read the reading on it? Give me just a moment here. It, uh, I'll bring it even closer if you want so that you can actually read it. The reason I want you to read it is because calculate uh, calculate the input which the manufacturer specifies okay, go ahead. and then uh, calculate the output which the manufacturer puts on there for that same amount of voltage and you'll see immediately that this thing is putting out uh, more energy than it, it was put into it. So the manufacturer really actually states the input and the output and it's on the label and they have tested it or they would not have put it on there. So it exists. It, here's an over unity device uh, looking right at you. Okay. And there are a lot of them that are that way if you bother to calculate uh, the input and the output. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, this is one of uh, many devices which I have built. Uh, I would say one of uh, several hundred. Uh -huh. 
and uh, uh, this is one of the uh, sort of intermediate ones. Okay. And uh, technology present here is largely uh, uh, 1800s. Uh huh. And well, what is this here? Uh, what is the device? Yeah. What do you got here? Uh, it's a resonant uh, electrical energy generator. Well, what does it do? Uh, basically, what I do, I take a low voltage at uh, 12 volts at uh, about seven amp hours mm -hmm. from a battery, and I run it through the device. The first thing I do, uh, in order the uh, uh, high voltage module here, uh, has to run off 120 volts. So uh, since I'm intending to use a 12 volt battery, I have to bring the voltage up to so that the high voltage module can run. Okay. So this is an inverter here. Okay. And this is just a Radio Shack part. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, everything you see here except these. Uh, most anyone could get, and these. Uh, now this and this, uh, unless you get them from me, uh, you don't get you don't get them. <laughs> so these these are your homemade ones here. Well, they were special made for me. What are they? Are can you give me? An idea? Well, these are uh, ten thousand volt capacitors. Wow. And what's the uh, this is a nine thousand volt high voltage module that is similar to the little one that I showed just a moment ago, okay. and uh, it. Uh, uh, this is from the same people. Uh, this is uh, about 6,000 volts, and this is 9,000 volts. Okay. Uh, this is essentially a solid state device, and so is this. Okay. So how does the how does it go here? Which, well, where does what go? Where does it start? Okay, it comes in here. Okay. And uh, comes from a 9 volt battery. Okay. There's a cord that's calculated to a certain length because it's uh, a frequency that works with the uh, the uh, it's a quarter wavelength of uh, this coil here. Okay. Uh, the length, physical length of the input from the 12 volt battery, and the reason for that is that it will recharge the battery if it uh, can communicate with the radio frequency. Uh, magnetic field that's in the area. I see. So it's just constantly recharging. Yeah, the magnetic field from what's going on here will recharge the battery faster than it's being discharged. That's great. Um, besides that, being a how do I know that? Uh, the, uh, if you take a light emitting diode, uh, electricity can only flow in one direction in a light emitting diode. Take two of them and reverse them and make a pigtail and put them in the line that comes from the battery to the device and uh, depending on which one's lighting up uh, you know which way the electricity is flowing. Okay. And when they're both lit up uh, you're uh, taking out and you're putting in at the same time and the reason you can do that is that they're different frequencies. Okay, uh, we've got uh, 12 volts coming in. We have a kickback diode here, which prevents a kickback from the uh, inverter to the battery. Okay. And uh, we also have the uh, on the uh, uh, input where the 12 volt comes in. We have uh, this pigtail set of uh, light emitting diodes, which uh, uh, tell you that you're charging your battery at the same time that you're using it. Okay. And uh, once we get past that point and get into this inverter, uh, this is 9,000 volt uh, high voltage module, which would be it's a version of a Tesla coil, except it's a solid state version. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. It does the same thing as a Tesla coil, except it's solid state uh, version of the same action. Yeah. So anyhow, in order to control that, since we don't want to use the full 9,000 volts, I have a uh, neon tube transformer uh, uh, control here, which uh, controls the amount of the 110 volts that comes out of this and to this. Okay. Uh, I can uh, use the whole 9,000 volts or I can use any part of it. And uh, the reason I have to cut it back is because what's over here cannot take what's over here. Well, I'm going to end up with a lot more voltage than I can manage. <laughs> well, so I have, to, I have to reduce it. It's easier to reduce it on the uh, low end. Once it gets to the high end, you have trouble uh, 
special equipment and a lot of trouble uh, varying it. Okay. So I vary it on the input on the low side. Yeah. Okay, I get to the high voltage module and it on neon tube transformers they have two uh, output wires. So I have to take the uh, electricity that's on the two output wires and put it back together as one source of electricity. And then I have to pump it through the L1 coil and then back into the system. And then I have the capacitor bank here in order to help regulate that. And that's, I'm sorry, you said that was 100,000? Oh, no, these are 10,000. Okay. Or maybe 15. I don't recall just at the moment, but they're more likely 15. Okay. But they were done uh, special order by Cornell Duvier wow. for me, and they were free. <laughs> well, that's nice. Because uh, uh, most of the companies like that have a, uh, a department where they will make up samples for you if you're uh, doing research and development yeah. uh, and you need something which they don't have in the catalog, they will make them up special for you and that's exactly what happened here. Really? Okay, once we get uh, to the, uh, uh, this is the broadcast end of it or the, uh, the part that sets the electromagnetic field into oscillation. Now, how do you do that? Is it sending a radio wave through? Well, uh, it's a, when you pulse something uh, and you pulse it through a coil like this, a magnetic field builds and collapses. And that's all you And it's a collapsing, building and collapsing off and on that spins the electrons. The, the magnetic field and then the magnetic field off and they'll spin back to where they were. So you've got the coin flipping with the electromagnetic uh, component flipping. And once you've got it flipping, then you're in uh, business. So that's the whole trick to this. Is just yeah, to yeah. But once you've got it flipping, then you've got to have something to collect it with. And then this, the rest of this is the collector and storage part. So what do you have, just a couple of capacitors there? And no, those are... Actually, those are uh, there's 8,000 volts worth of capacitors there. Are those special made? Uh, no. Really? What's the little tube on the end there? Uh, which one? I said a little yellow one. The yellow one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that has a double meaning. In this case, it has no meaning because I've already uh, charging the battery from over here. Oh, was that used to... to but, uh, energy? but the energy coming from here before it goes out to the transformer is passing through this one and that's building a magnetic field. This one is not connected to this one in any way except through a magnetic field. So this becomes a generator of electricity and you can charge batteries from that. That's great. That's, I mean, that's a great system. How much energy would you say this little system could produce? This one? Uh, what's the output on it? Yeah. Uh, it's about uh, 16 kVA. Great which is a lot of energy. Yeah, and that's it can go higher than that. Uh, that's uh, with this thing turned down on low. Wow. Now does it like run itself out? I mean, uh, no, uh, there's nothing here to wear out. Wow. So there's no... Uh, the capacitors are self-healing. So this is, this is it. You've got a closed loop system that charges itself and kicks off enough energy to... You know, once it's going, it's on its own. <laughs> No, uh, this this is sort of an intermediate model. Yeah. And uh, there's a larger one sitting over here, uh, a more commercial type. Uh, uh, this one actually, uh, the one in the suitcase uh, calculates out at about, uh, uh, I put in the book a uh, little article I gave you, I think it was 27 kVA. No kidding. It's, a one, uh, it's about half the size of this. Wow. So this is capable of... Uh, uh, probably around 50 kVA. Now, is this is this something that you give away as far as p selling plans to people or showing people? How well, to uh, the plans for some of these things are in the publications. So this is not any great secret. This is out there. No, it's uh, looking people in the face. <laughs> A commercial model, and uh, the 
absolute uh, output level on it, I don't know, but uh, uh, some of the components in there would probably limit it to about 35,000 volts at probably about uh, uh, 200 amperes. And that is an enormous amount of electricity. So uh, you can see that it has the same components that the other device has. Uh, they're just uh, scaled up somewhat. Have you used this one here? Uh, I've had it, uh, I've started it, and I know that it, it uh, I've tested it, but I haven't uh, ran this particular one for any extended period of time except to just start it. So this was just sort of an experiment to see if you could build a computer? Well, uh, basically it was just to uh, see how the components fit on the board was what it was. Because I did the schematics and passed them on to other people, and uh, they're building them. Okay. Great. Use that on this. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you how to make a sample one. Okay, great. Uh, most of the things that are in my devices, which I demonstrate, uh, were put there because people expect to see them, not because they need to be there. Okay. Okay, so this, this device, which I had turned upside down. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, is uh, the high voltage module here. So we come out and we need a L1 uh, coil here. Okay. It's going to be our L1, our input coil. And we're going to run this, uh, since this is alternating current, it's neither plus or minus. It's going to be, uh, what it's going to be doing is uh, coming over here and into here and coming back just like that. Okay. So we've got our high voltage device and we've got an L1 coil and it's all working just fine. At this point it's running at 35,000 cycles per second. Okay, and we don't, uh, the method I'm teaching you here, uh, you don't have to know about uh, tuning. Uh, the fact that you, the length of the wires that go on this coil here are basically irrelevant because uh, it's being pumped by the uh, uh, high voltage device here and that's going to set the frequency that the length of the wires are not going to have anything to do with it. So you don't have to know how to tune it to do this. Okay, okay the next thing is that we're going to have an L2 coil here and it's going to have a coils on it and it's going to be out and this is going to be your uh, uh, minus and uh, this is going to be your plus down here at the bottom and uh, electricity or electrical field always moves from the highest of concentration to the lowest but in this case what's happening is uh, each coil there has a capacitant uh, and inductive uh, characteristic so it's magnifying, for example, say that this is uh, 3,000 volts here, and we have 10 turns here. So uh, this is volts, and we have 10 turns. Okay, we divide 10 into 3,000, and that means that each turn is going to equal 300 volts. So uh, each turn on a L2 coil here, each turn on there will uh, have uh, 300 volts on it. So if you have uh, uh, 30 turns, uh, you've got uh, 300, uh, 300 times uh, 30, which would be... Let's see, 300 times 30. Okay, and that's going to be a, a zero, a zero, zero, nine. So that you're going to have a 9,000 volts on your L2 coil. Okay. Okay. Uh, and it's going to do that irregardless of the amount of turns or the frequency or whatever, what we're doing by forcing the uh, 35,000 cycles per second onto this uh, first coil, we're forcing that second coil to duplicate the same thing as long as it's an even division of or multiple.
responsible of the wire length and the first coil. Okay. So we've got at this point we've got 9,000 volts out, and uh, uh, we probably will want to put a, a spark gap of some sort in here so that we can. And this goes to your earth ground. Okay, the center spark, center part of the spark gap will go to earth ground. Okay. Okay, and this is going to limit the voltage uh, so that uh, it's within the range which you can handle it with whatever device you're going to load this with. Okay. So you can go directly from this uh, into a your transformer out here, and it'd be an isolation transformer. And uh, at this point, what you have to do, since you've got a frequency which the uh, isolation transformer cannot use, you have to correct the frequency. So in order to correct the frequency, uh, you put a resistor across the two poles there. In order to determine what resistor size you use, uh, you go to uh, uh, either the American Radio Relay League uh, a chart showing uh, uh, capacitance and resistance and other types of things uh, which will tell you what approximate frequency you'll end up with. Now in the case of American Radio Relay League you're going to be off the end of the chart and you're going to have to take a little piece of paper and make the grid and extend the chart over about an inch or so and about an inch or so down in order to get say 60 cycles or 120 or whatever it is you want but it, you can do that real easy. Okay. So anyhow, we've got through our uh, 12 volts and none of the electrons from the 12 volt battery have left the high voltage module. Uh, uh, the high voltage module uh, has excited electrons in a separate, uh, uh, just like your, uh, 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 your transformer here where you have uh, the two sides are separated from each other so that none of the electricity on this side actually goes through the system and what it does through induction it excites the coil on the other side and your uh, electricity over here is coming from the earth earth grounding and your load is going to be uh, in between the earth grounding and the other pole of that transformer and you're going to have to also put uh, some sort of voltage control on on uh, this thing here and uh, that will be a varactor v-a-r-a-c-t-e-r -E and uh, what that is uh, like on your computer where you have a voltage control thing that keeps the spikes from coming in mm -hmm. uh, it looks like a little capacitor but it's not Okay. But it basically will limit the voltage to uh, some level which is okay for the device that you're trying to run. Now, uh, what I have shown you here, uh, you don't know, have to know how to tune it. Uh, it uh, that takes care of itself for you, and you have to make only one uh, correction in the uh, frequency, and any coil and resistor, or any coil and capacitor, or any combination of those will give you a particular frequency. Now, uh, Radio Shack has a book on uh, uh, electronic tables and such, and uh, uh, you can use the charts in it. Okay. Is this the smaller simplified version? Uh, no, there's uh, some solid state versions of this where all of this is thrown out. <laughs> but I'm not at liberty to talk about them just now. But this this can give somebody an idea that you don't actually have to come. You don't, you don't have to know what you're doing at all.